So I think it's fitting that Blake Ellis started the day convincing us all that we should be more lazy. And I'm going to end the day talking a little more about how we could be more productive. And then it's up to you to just choose which one you want to do, where you want to go. So uh, before I talk about productivity, though, I want to talk to you about a buffet. I don't know how many of you were at the citizen advocacy dinner last night, but it was, it's a truly amazing organization, and it's an unbelievable, tremendous buffet. But I can't say that I didn't have mixed emotions when I was there. Because I arrive at this buffet, and there's, there must be 60 or 70 different delicious dishes made with love. And the question is, sort of how do you choose? Right? And so I, I got up from the table, and I was with my wife, and our two kids were playing. Uh, th we have three kids, but two of them were there, and they were playing in the back. And I, I pick up the, our plates and, and head into the line, and Eleanor, or me, Eleanor, my wife, immediately looks at me with some serious concern on her face. And I say, sweetie, don't worry, I got this. It's totally under control. And she looks at me and she goes, but you have three plates in your hand. I said, no, it's, I got it. It's not a problem. I got it. This is for Daniel and Sophia. I'm fine. I'm going to just get the food for them. You sure? Yeah, I'm sure. So I go through the line and I'm looking and I start taking things. And I'm thinking, well, in mac and cheese, they'll like that. But there's five or six different mac and cheeses, right? So I don't know which one they're going to like. So I just take a little bit of them all. And, and I take some salads, and I take the deviled eggs, and will they eat the hummus? Maybe. Except. And, and so I continue on. Then I see someone at the lima beans on their plate, and I oh, where'd they get that? So I go to the other line, and I kind of start to find things from the other line, and I bring that in, you know, a big piece of chicken, because Daniel might eat chicken. And, uh, and, and what I come back with, I have, you know, a plate of salad, which is great, right? Because I'm really, I'm really um, healthy and taking care of myself. But then I... I, I follow with a couple of other plates of things, right? Things that kind of looked interesting to me. I mean, you need a dessert. And Eleanor says, what are you doing? And I said, well, you know, I'm getting it for the table. And, and she says, sweetie, we all have our own food. I'm, I don't know, but I'm just going to taste it. I'm, I'm not going to eat it all. And the truth is, you know, I'm not going to eat it all because, because this is the size of your stomach. This is the size of your stomach expanded, actually a little bigger. It's amazing that Starbucks sells a cup that's actually larger than the size of your stomach. This is actually <laughs> slightly larger than the size of your stomach. But, you know, I start to stuff things in, and of course, you know, um, this stuff goes in first because other people might eat it, you know, so I'm going <laughs> to kind of throw a bunch of that stuff in. And then maybe I'll try to get the, the uh, stuff it in really well. And then maybe a few leaves of lettuce. By the way. And, and at the end, maybe I need a napkin, at the end, I'm, I'm feeling pretty grossed out and sick and overwhelmed and thinking, wow, that was probably a mistake, <laughs> right? But the amazing thing is that that is a mistake that I have made countless times before, <laughs> and it doesn't seem to change. Um, I want to describe, ooh, this is good. <laughs> I want to describe a little bit what this problem is, because you, there's a million different things you can eat at a buffet, right? Lots of really good-looking things. And here's the problem. The problem is that in the face of unlimited options, we often make choices that do not, do not serve our best term, our best long-term interest. Right? That we have something we want to achieve. Let's call it the big arrow. The big arrow is the direction you want to go in life. The big arrow is what you want to eat, and it's the goal. And my goal is to be fit and to be lean and to be healthy. And that is my goal with eating. And all of those little arrows are all of the different things that I could possibly eat. And the reason we don't make good short-term decisions often, the reason in the face of unlimited options we often make choices that do not serve our best long-term interest, is because what I want to eat is different than what I want to have eaten. Right? What I want to eat is different than what I want to have eaten. And of course, I'm not just talking about buffets, I'm talking about life, right? Because there are a million things to do. I have, you know, uh, to, to talk with Eleanor about a uh, trip that we're gonna take, I have several phone calls, I've got a CEO meeting, I've gotta write a screenplay, I've gotta write the next book. There's all these millions of things to do. And, and how do we decide? And, and not only that, but you heard earlier this idea that George shared that you, you go to your email for two minutes and you emerge three years later, right? And so we've got, we've got all these things and all of these temptations. And, and in the face of unlimited options, we make decisions that are not in our best, best long-term interests. And the things that I want to do now, 
like watch four more episodes of Weeds. The thing that I want to do right now is not necessarily the thing that I want to have done by the end of the day. And this is the challenge that I was facing. And I really felt for many, many years that this was a motivation problem. Right? And I, I, I even joined Anderson Consulting in a moment of weakness for about a year because I thought it would build discipline in me. It didn't work. In fact, the truth is nothing worked. I, I've, I've tried for 25 years to be a better person than I am, and what I've realized 25 years later is that I really can't be a better person than I am. It's not because I'm a great person. It's just because I can't get any better. I've just tried. I've tried all these things. I need a better solution. I, I've tried to increase my willpower. I've tried to increase my discipline. I've tried to, and what I've realized is our problem in life, my problem in life, is not a motivation problem. It's a casino problem, right? And that life is, has, is, is the house. Right? It's stacked against it. I'm playing with a, a stack of cards that's stacked against me that wants me to do all these things. People call and they want things, and I'm not necessarily thinking, does this fit with my big arrow, my, you know, my life purpose? Am I going to do? I'm not necessarily thinking that. I'm thinking, oh, that sounds interesting. Oh, that's fun. Yeah, sure, I'd love to go parachuting. Sure. <laughs> right? And so, so the question is, you know, how do you shape your, how do you restack the deck? If this is a casino problem, then I don't want to just become a better poker player. I want, to re I want to be the house, right? I want to restack the deck. And the question is, how do I restack the deck? And I did not have an answer. So I wrote a book about it. And what I discovered after several years of, of kind of playing with things is that there are a few steps that you need to take to restack the deck. But you have to restack the deck so that it is more likely for you to make choices that are in your best interest, then less likely. And one of the ideas of how to deal with this came to me when I was in a safari in Africa. Actually, Walt Disney would like you to think it was a safari in Africa. It was actually in the animal kingdom in Orlando, Florida. But <laughs> it really felt, it felt to me like a safari in Africa. And, and I, was, I was going through the lumbering train and I saw on top of this hill there was, on top of a rock was this majestic lion. And I said to the ranger, that's amazing. We are so lucky that the lion is out there the day we happen to go by, right? And he obviously laughed at me and said, you know, the lion's always there. And I said, well, you know, is he stuffed? He said, no, 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 he's not stuffed. And I said, well, is he tied down? Is he glued to the rock? Have you nailed him there? He said, no. No. So I said, well, how? You know, and it took me about an hour to get it out of him because in Walt Disney, they're not supposed to share this stuff. It turns out, it's a brilliant solution. It turns out that the rock is temperature controlled, right? And on really, really hot days, it's cool. And on really cool days, if they exist in Orlando, it's hot. This is the brilliance. What you do is you don't train the lion. You don't force the lion. You just make the rock the place that the lion wants to be, right? And this is the game. This is the game of what we have to do so that we fit the little arrows into our big arrows. So what I did, oh, look at that. This is a house. Did this just turn on or has it been here the whole time? Oh, well, it's nice. So this is where I used to live in Savannah. This is where um, Eleanor and I and, and our family about three, three or four years ago lived in Savannah for a few years. And this is the house where we live. And those French doors lead directly to our kitchen. And that table is the first piece of furniture, actually it turns out maybe the only piece of furniture in three years that we bought. And the reason we bought it is because when we moved to Savannah, it was very important to us to spend time outdoors. And we wanted to eat outdoors. And we bought that table and we had the chairs and we sat outside and we ate one meal outdoor. One meal. You know why? Because it just, we went out, then we had to go back and get the orange juice, then Isabel spilt the orange juice, so we had to go back to get the orange juice. And it just somehow, it, it was just a little too, I, I mean, we're lazy, right? But it was just a little too hard to eat outside. We just never did. And then I had an idea, and it came from the lion and the rock. And we moved the table. But here's the thing, this is the crazy thing, right? We moved it with seven feet and four steps. We ate every single meal outside. <laughs> every single meal we ate outside. That's all it took, right? 
It's stacking the deck in your favor. So the question is, how do you then stack the deck for life? Right? What are the things that you do? And I want to go through a little bit of a process. It's sort of a, a three-step process. The first is you understand what your focus is. You need to understand your big arrow. That's the first thing you need to do. Now, I um, thought about this for a while, and I thought, okay, what's my life purpose, and what am I here for? And you know what? If you know what your life purpose is, and you know why you're here in the world, God bless you. That's great. I don't. And, and, it, and I do, but then it changes. And so I think I'm here for a lot of different reasons, and I can't quite figure them all out. And it's paralyzing to try to figure out, like, what your life purpose is. So I would like to give you a pass to excuse you from having to figure out that question. All I'm going to suggest that you do for your big arrow is figure out what is your year about. Right? That's much more digestible. What is it that you want to achieve over the year? What are, forget about achieve. That's even too difficult. Think about what you want to focus on. What you want to focus on in the year. I came up with, I thought about it, and for this year, for example, I have five things I want to focus on. Why five? Uh, I don't know. It worked, right? Four didn't seem enough. Six seemed too much. So I have five. And my five things are, you know, it was... Uh, Focus on my current clients, right? Grow the business and find new clients. Speak and write about my ideas. Uh, promote my new book. By the way, it comes out in September. It's called 18 Minutes. Check. Um, uh, and then nurture myself and my family. Those are my five things that I wanted to do. And I just decided, okay, that's my big arrow. That's what I wanted to do. So are we done? Like, if you had this, would you be, w will I achieve them? No, these are called New Year's resolutions, <laughs> right? And, and you'll, you'll focus on them for two weeks. And then in January 15th, you're going to have a hard time remembering what they were. But you still need it. You need to know what your big arrow is. And the big arrow has to be digestible. And, it has to be th and they're not even goals. I'm not telling you how many clients I want. And I just, these are things I want to focus on. I want to make sure that in my life, these are the things that take priority. So I move forward in them. So that's step one. Step two is you have to somehow funnel all of these little arrows. Because look, this was the brownie sundae. Doesn't really fit into where I'm headed, right? Neither does this. This one could, right? Because maybe it was that salad, but maybe it was seven bowls of salad. So I just need to redirect it in this direction so it's focused more. So what I need to do is fit the arrows inside, the little arrows inside the big arrow and focus them. And the way I do that is with a to-do list. It's very innovative. And but I wanted to share with you a little bit about this to-do list because I'm going to suggest a different to-do list, maybe, than you've done in the past. And this is what the to-do list looks like, right? It's a six-box to-do list. And I suggest for various reasons that you use pen and paper. And can you guess what are in these boxes? Right? The top is my current clients, my future clients, speak and write about my ideas, promote my book, nurture, myself and my family. And any time I need to do something, I go here and I put it here. What I do is I force any activity that is going to fit on my to-do list to fit in one of these categories. And if it doesn't fit in one of those categories, I either decide not to do it or I put it in this box called the other 5%. Now, when I first started doing this, the only box that I could fill was the other 5%. Right? The other 5% turned out to be 95%. Right? This is the hardest part, because the hardest part is not coming up with a creative and innovative idea. The hardest part is following through on that creative and innovative idea to actually make it something in the world. That's the hardest part. The game of time management, of life management, is, is going from point A all the way to the end to point B. And so once I realize that, and this is what I do every single day, once I realize that, and then over a couple of days, it became obvious, and I started to fill these other boxes. Right? So now I had a to-do list that was focused on each of my boxes, and I had something in the other 5%, and I worked very hard to make sure it doesn't take up more than 5 or 15% of my time. But I don't go beyond 15. No, no. But I do, I have these categories, and I fill these categories with all sorts of activities that will help me focus in these areas. Right? Um, you know, when, when Eleanor, my wife, started doing this, 
she has, had been frustrated for some time about her career. It wasn't moving forward. She wasn't doing exactly the things that she wanted to do. When she first did this, this becomes a diagnostic. She found that there was one box, which was family, which is a very important focus and priority for her and for me, and yet that was the only box with anything in it. So it's no surprise that you're frustrated with your career when the box you know, called chaplain and there's not much happening, or minister, not much happening, right? And so it becomes this diagnostic. So raise your hand if you feel like now we're done. Like as long as we've got our big arrow and we're focused on the to-do list that we're going to follow through on this stuff. Raise your hand if you think we're going to follow through. Well, you're right. I kind of thought I would, <laughs> um, but I was wrong. Here's the thing, that in the end, the smartest thing that you can do with your to-do list, the smartest thing that you could do with the buffet is make sure that it all fits in the size of your stomach. And the equivalent of the size of your stomach is your calendar day. That's all you've got. You've got your day. There's a tremendous amount of research that suggests that if you decide when and where you're going to do something, you will do it. Right? They asked a bunch of drug addicts on withdrawal to write an essay before 5 p.m. None of them did it. It's a big surprise. <laughs> then, then they said to them, tell us when and where you're going to write this essay. More than 80% of them did it. Women doing breast cancer, self, self breast cancer checks, self checks. Sometime in the next month, 53% of them did it. Tell me exactly when and where you're going to do it, 100% did it. This research has been repeated over and over again. Yale students getting immunizations. They told them how important it was. They gave them maps with arrows as to where they can get the immunizations. They made it free. None of that impacted it. Suddenly, they just said, write in your calendar when and where you're going to do it. They all did it. The most important thing that you can do if you want to get something done is to take things from this categorized to-do list, which you know is all important, and place it onto your calendar. Right. So the next thing, how about now? Are we done? Are you going to get this stuff done? Yeah, no, maybe? All right, one more thing. I'm going to share with you one more thing. Because even that didn't work for me. I needed a process. I needed a process. And here was the process. The process is 18 minutes. 18 minute process. Broken out this way, five minutes, the beginning of your day, one minute each hour, assuming a nine, minute, a nine hour day, nine minute day, you wouldn't get much done, and then five minutes in the end. So what is it that you do? In the five minutes in the morning, before turning on your email, before suck, getting sucked into the year of email, I have a friend who started a new job and when she first started her job, she opened up her computer with the password they had given her. She'd never logged in, and she had 385 messages waiting for her. 385 messages. By the time she would get through them, she'd have another 385. Before turning on your email, take a look at your to-do list, move things onto your calendar, and plan out your day. Plan out your day hour by hour. Decide what you're going to do and when you're going to do it. Create that plan. Step two, every hour I have my watch beep. And when the watch beeps, I take a deep breath. First of all, everyone take a deep breath. Feels good, right? So worst comes to the worst, you follow this, you'll have nine minutes of feeling good. So you, you, you take a deep breath. And in that deep breath, you ask yourself two questions. What I've been working on in the last hour, has that been the most effective use of my time? And what I'm about to work on for the next hour, is that the most effective and productive use of my time? And if your answer is yes, keep going. If it's no, make a switch. We get lost in the many, many distractions that come throughout the day. It is we cannot rely on willpower. We need to create the system that makes it more likely, restack the deck, the system that makes it more likely that we will continue to move forward on the areas that we consider to be important to us. So every minute, every hour you're doing that for one minute, and then the last five minutes of the day, this is where you treat life as an experiment. And you treat life as an experiment because you look back in your day. This is possibly the most important thing that you can do. You look back in your day and you say, okay, what I've been doing, uh, how, how did today go? What worked? What didn't work? What do I want to do for tomorrow? If you have time, create your to-do list and your calendar for tomorrow. Where do I want to focus? And then finally, I've gotten into this habit that is just a miraculous and beautiful habit, which is I ask myself, who did I touch today? And who touched me? And what quick emails or reach outs should I do? 
Who do I have to thank for something? Who do I have to update on something? Who do I have to request something from? Who do I need to reach out to based on everything that happened that I could kind of wrap up today? That system, understanding your big arrow, understanding how the little arrows fit in, focusing it in a to-do list that forces you to put everything that you need to do in that particular category so that you know it's moving you forward, that you know it's maintaining your focus, and then keeping yourself focused throughout the day makes the biggest difference. Now, the salad. I figured out how to deal with buffets. I didn't do it last night. But I have figured out how to deal with buffets. And again, the simplest system. What is it that enables you to create a situation where you're more likely to do the thing that you want to do long term? And for a buffet, it's a salad plate. Right? You walk through the buffet with a salad plate. I try to put about half or three quarters with vegetables, and the rest I put whatever else I want. And, this is, and I only walk through once. That's my process. That's my 18 minutes. I walk through once with one small plate. And I pick the things that I want, and I stay within my arrow. I want to uh, share just a quick story to end, which is that uh, I, when I lived in Savannah, I played a lot of ultimate frisbee. And there was a guy uh, who played ultimate frisbee who was in amazing shape. He was an older, well, not older. He was 50. I'll let you make your judgment about how old that is. But he was, he was 50. Uh, uh, he's close. I'm actually scaringly, he was about my age. And... And, but he was in really amazing shape. He was in really amazing shape. And I, the thing about him is he was also a total stoner. And it, I was sort of confused as to how he could be in such great shape um, and seem so unmotivated. And I, uh, so I asked him, and I said, you know, what, what is it? And he said, oh, I run every day, dude. <laughs> um, and, and I said, like, that's amazing. You must really love running. And he said, I, dude, I hate running. I was like, so what do you do? And he goes, I've got this foolproof method. Tell me. So he goes, I go home at the end of the day. I'm tired. I don't really feel like running. So I decide I'm not going to run. But I decide, you know what? It's a nice day. I'm going to put my running sneakers on and my shorts, and I'm just going to go sit out on the porch. And he goes out, and he sits out on the porch. He sits there for a minute, and he goes, you know, a nice day. I've got my running sneakers on, my shorts. Look at that. I might as well go for a run. And then he goes for a run. Right? And it's this idea that don't, don't make yourself feel guilty. Don't try to make yourself too much of a better person. It's really, really hard. Create the situation. Follow a to-do list that forces you to put the things you want to do in your big arrows, in your areas of focus. Go through the buffet with a salad plate. Right? Create a warm rock for the lion to sit on. Move your table. And finally, if you really want to go for a run, if you want to make sure that by the end of the day you've gone for a run, put on your running sneakers and go stand out on the porch. Thank you very much.